I'm very happy to open the eighth annual joint conference of Columbia Law School and Ono Academic College. Asaf and I prepared a program which we believe is uh, current and rewarding. There is just one change in the program. Unfortunately, Paul Ro uh, could not come. His father is going through some medical procedure uh, and Ted Mervis will have to speak twice as much to cover for him. <laughs> um, as you know, the, a lot of activity in corporate area in Israel is taking place since the establishment of the economic division. And last night when I was thinking about it, it reminded me of uh, Kevin Costner's movie saying, if you build it, they will come. So in no time, uh, Plaintiff Bar has evolved and challenging our judicial system about how to regulate corporate activity. Um, with no further ado, I please welcome Justice Yoram Denziger from the Israeli Supreme Court. Thanks a lot. Good morning. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you, Zohar, for inviting me. Um, I would like to talk about the evaluation of the business according to Israeli law. As you know, the Israeli company law from 2000 stipulates that in certain cases, minority shareholders who decided not to accept a tender offer, not to accept the bid, they can, in certain cases, as I said, seek a court-directed appraisal of the stock. Unfortunately, the Israeli law does not dictate the methods according to which the court should make such final determination as to the value of the shares. Following contradicting district court decision during the last 10 years, we decided in the Etzmon case, Etzmon case is from the 28th of December 2009, by a majority of two against one, that the valuation method to be applied is the DCF method. By the way, I stress that this method is not applicable in, in each and every case. There are some cases where you should adopt and apply other valuation methods. But the DCF method should be the governing method in principle. Former Deputy President Justice Eliezer Rivlin wrote the minority opinion in the Atzmon case suggested that the best way to evaluate a business is according to the market value method. And he actually insisted on enlarging the panel in three new cases that came to the Supreme Court after the Etzmon case. So we sat in a seven members panel in a case known as the Kital case. A decision was given actually less than two years on the 28th of August 2012. Once again, in this case, there was a majority and a minority opinion. I wrote, once again, the majority opinion, and I was backed by three of my colleagues. Justice Rivlin and Justice Edna Albell, who is present here, wrote the minority opinion, according to which, once again, the best and more applicable method to evaluate the business value is the average market valuation method. I should note that there was a, min a single, not a minority, a single opinion by the seventh justice at that panel, Justice Meltzer, but there was a four to one opinions in this case. Both in the Atzmon and in the Kital case, we approved the procedure employed by Israeli district courts, according to which they should render their decisions as to the business value based upon the party's arguments and the experts' valuations that are presented to them. We all know that DCF model typically can generate a wide range of estimates. Usually the separation between the plaintiff's and the defendant's valuation is substantial, to say the least. In most cases, the two valuations differ by a margin substantially greater than the <clears throat> academics and valuation experts would describe as a reasonable degree of distinction. 
The incentive uh, for parties to submit widely disparate valuations is understandable. However, we as judges are requested to make the final determination as to the business value. In most cases, as I said, the court will render its decision based solely upon the parties' valuations and arguments. However, using this conservative decision-making method usually encourage the parties to continue submitting such valuations that differ dramatically. How can we solve this problem? Is there a way to solve this problem? In many cases, the court will appoint a neutral evaluator who can decide on behalf of the court which of the two valuations presented to the court is closer to the preferable outcome, the, the real business value. And I must say that there is another method not employed in Israel yet. It may be considered as a, well, maybe quite a tough way to estimate the value of the shares, but it's something to think about. This method is called the final offer arbitration procedure. Final offer arbitration procedure, or FOA. In FOA is the parties submit a final binding offer, uh, uh, sorry, uh, binding offers as to the shares value and the court, either by itself or using the assistance of evaluator, the neutral evaluator, decides which of the two valuations should be adopted. It does not take the two valuations and uh, add them together and split them by two. It chooses the one that is, in the eyes of the court, is closer to the actual valuation of the business. As far as I recall, there was one case where the American Delaware court tried to adopt this system, which comes actually from sports. I think it's the National Baseball League. <laughs> it's a mechanism that was adopted in sports, but let's talk about our subject. So, I mentioned, by the way, the FOA in Kital case, but till now, as I said, nobody adopted it. So, in a case known as the Gonzalez case, Gonzalez against straight arrow publishers, in back in 1996, Chancellor William Allen of the Delaware Court of Chancery attempted to implement the FOA appraisal procedure. At issue in Gonzalez was the value of Laurel Gonzalez 2.3% of the total outstanding shares of Straight Aero Publishers, Incorporated, SAP. Back in 1985, Straight Aero Publishers Holding Company, SAP HCC, wholly owned by SAP's founder and majority stockholder, made a $100 per share cash tender offer for SAP's shares. Laurel Gonzalez filed a complaint demanding appraisal of her shares on 5th of May 1986. Discovery in this case continued for 10 years. In October 1996, Chancellor Allen accepted appraisal submissions for from each party. Laurel Gonzalez submitted an appraisal of $1,059 per share. SAP appraised the stock at $132 per share. Chancellor Allen performed a detailed review of each party's valuation, rejected Gonzalez's valuation, accepted SAP's valuation, the 132. On appeal, the Delaware Supreme Court reversed Chancellor Allen's decision, stating that FOA appraisal procedure, and I quote, was error as a matter of law, and according to the Delaware Supreme Court, Chancellor Allen had failed to independently determine the value of the shares that are the subject of the appraisal action. And by that failure, according to the Supreme Court of Delaware, had not fulfilled the requirement of Section 262H of the Delaware Code annotated, according to which, and I quote, the court shall appraise the shares, the court and not the parties. I'm not sure whether there were other attempts to implement the FOA appraisal procedure in Delaware. Maybe we will hear an answer from Justice Andy Holland of the Delaware Supreme Court soon. It is my opinion that accepting one party's valuation on the other or the other using the FOA appraisal method would have a significant institutional advantage. 
The DCF model can generate, as I said earlier, a wide range of estimates. The incentive of the contenting parties is to arrive to estimates of value suitable for their needs. If, if it is understood that the court will accept the whole of one party's valuation, incentives will be modified. The parties will have incentives to make their valuations more reasonable. This would tend to narrow the range of estimates, which would be great benefit to the process. I know that Professor Raoud Kamar of the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law, whom you will hear later on today, agrees with me. Actually, he wrote an article in Globes ages ago, a month after the Etzmon case in January 2010, following this decision of the Etzmon case, stating that it's a, it's a good idea to adopt the FOA system. I do hope the judges of the district courts, especially those of the economic division of the Tel Aviv district court present here, Ruth Ronen and Khaled Kaboub, may consider adopting this uh, way of valuation. Maybe, maybe we can do things better than Delaware. I hope so. Okay, so that's what I had to say, and I would like Justice Holland to come over and continue. Thank you. Hi, good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you. We're talking today about adjudicating corporation cases, and I thought I'd start by giving a little background on the Delaware system in our courts, and then give a case study, uh, an evolution, a chronology, if you will, of some issues involving controlling shareholders. Uh, in Delaware, at the trial level, corporate cases are decided by the Court of Chancery, and there are five judges on the Court of Chancery. It's like your um, economic court. Appeals go directly to the Delaware Supreme Court, where we also have five justices. So all the corporation law in Delaware is made by 12 indivi uh, 10 individuals, 10 at the trial level, excuse me, five at the trial level, five at the Supreme Court level. And just by way of um, example, in the United States, there are 1,000 federal judges. As you know, Delaware law dominates corporate law because state law under our Constitution controls. So you can see if you have 10 people deciding corporate cases, you get more predictability and stability than if we had a national corporate law with 1,000 judges. Now, the appeals to the Delaware Supreme Court um, are decided unanimously 99% of the time. We were hearing about your divided decision, and the reason we come out unanimously 99% of the time is because we must decide the case. We don't get to pick and choose. And in deciding the case, we narrow the holding. So many times the Delaware Supreme Court is criticized for not deciding some issue on the horizon, but we've said many times in Paramount, for example, we only decide the case before us. This is known as the Delaware unanimity norm. And it's not just corporate cases, but other cases we decide unanimously 99% of the time. But that's particularly important in corporate cases because businesses would like to know what the law is going to be. And by having unanimous decisions, it promotes stability and predictability. Uh, I'm sure you're still waiting for the final answer on how to value corporations, although you currently have the majority positions, but obviously the minority view uh, is also strong. The other aspect of deciding cases that's unique to Delaware is that we decide cases promptly. Uh, we have a rule that all courts must decide cases 90 days after they're ready to be decided. So that means the briefing is done, the argument takes place, and we have to decide the case within 90 days. In Delaware, the Supreme Court on the average issues an opinion every 40 days. So you can tell your clients, we're going to get a decision in 90 days, but probably closer to 40 days. And in corporate matters, cases can be expedited if the parties want them expedited. 
So we have heard reference to former Chancellor Allen. In 1989, he decided the Time Warner case. Uh, I was on the appeal in that case. And there were six weeks of discovery. He issued a very long opinion. And three weeks later, it was decided by the Delaware Supreme Court unanimously. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, we had a case involving Liberty Media. It was a $9 billion issue. And the Delaware Supreme Court issued a unanimous 50-page opinion in seven days. Now, the reason we can do this um, is because of what I would call experience and expertise. And you develop the expertise through experience. We have 100 years of precedent. So when the judges on the Court of Chancery and the Delaware Supreme Court are deciding a case, they can look at what's been going on for 100 years and then advance the law incrementally or marginally. Because almost all of the publicly traded companies and all of the Fortune 500 companies are incorporated in Delaware, we have a lot of corporate litigation, and you also develop expertise through repetition. Uh, in addition to that, um, in the United States, states can pick judges any way they want. Some states elect judges. In Delaware, we appoint judges uh, based on merit selection, and we know when someone's going to the family court or the Court of Chancery or the Supreme Court what their background is, so we try to pick people who already have the expertise, and then they can continue to develop the expertise once they're on the court. Now, one of the things that's developed over time uh, in this 100 years is familiar to all of you, and that's the business judgment rule. And the business judgment rule is a presumption that the board of directors were informed meaning care, acted with loyalty and in the best interest of the corporation. So when you come into a Delaware court, it's presumed that you did it right. And that presumption is very powerful and it's very important because the Delaware courts recognize that if someone is going to take a risk, they have to have latitude when the decision doesn't succeed. So if you decide you're gonna invent the best car in the world and you act with care, loyalty, and good faith and your car is a failure, nobody buys it, you lose money, the Delaware Supreme Court would respect that decision because we want to encourage risk taking because that's the way a market economy works. But in a case called Aronson, the Delaware Supreme Court said you don't get the protection of the business judgment rule if it's an interested transaction. So if you're on both sides of the transaction, the business judgment rule presumption doesn't apply at all. And what you have to do is demonstrate to the court that the transaction was entirely fair. So what you can see is that under the business judgment rule, the burdens on the shareholder to show there was a problem under the entire fairness standard, the burdens on the directors to show that everything was fine. And obviously, directors and shareholders like different standards. Now, under the entire fairness standard, which is developed in a case called Weinberger, we said that you have to show fair dealing, meaning the process worked well, and then you have to show that you arrived at a fair price. Over time, the Delaware Supreme Court said these concepts apply to controlling shareholders. So if you're a controlling shareholder and you're involved with buying out the minority, it's an interested transaction. So the business judgment rule is not going to apply. And what I'm gonna tell you about are the cases over time where there was the debate between the Court of Chancery and the Delaware Supreme Court on how a controlling shareholder could ever get business judgment rule review rather than entire fairness review. Um, and, and it starts with a case called a Rosenblatt. And you remember I said, if you're on 
both sides of the transaction, it's your burden to show that it was entirely fair. And in the Rosenblatt case, the question was, well, how about if we get a majority of the minority shareholders to approve what we want to do? Can we get business judgment? And the Delaware Supreme Court said no. You can shift the burden to the plaintiff, but you can't get business judgment. So at that point in time, what you see is the controlling shareholder is trying to buy out the minority, the standards entire fairness, but if they show that a majority of the minority approved it, they can shift the burden. And then instead of the directors going first, the shareholders have to go first. So time went on, and the Court of Chancery um, is a very important court for many reasons that you know about. But one thing is that many of the Court of Chancery decisions are never appealed. And that means that they are the Delaware law until it comes to the Delaware Supreme Court. So years ago, one of the other issues that was percolating in the Court of Chancery was, what happens if you have an independent committee? They're separate from the controlling shareholder. How about if the independent committee approves the interested transaction? Can we get business judgment, or do we still have entire fairness? And the five judges on the Court of Chancery were divided. So that issue came to the Delaware Supreme Court in a case called Kahn versus Lynch. And in Kahn versus Lynch, the Delaware Supreme Court said no once again. If you have an independent committee that's fully functioning, you can shift the burden, but you still don't get entire fairness. So after Kahn versus Lynch, the law in Delaware was the controlling shareholder has to show entire fairness. But if they have a majority of the minority approving it, or, and or is the key word, an independent functioning committee approve it, they can shift the burden and they'll get, um, the other side will have to go first. Now, that turned out to be a problem as the years went by, because many times when you were looking at the independent committee, the function of the committee really related to the merits of the transaction. And the Court of Chancery decided we really can't decide whether the burden should shift until we have a trial. So the state of the law then was, before the trial, you can make a motion for summary judgment and say we have a fully functioning independent committee, please shift the burden, let's start the trial. Or you can say, we have a majority of the minority that's voted, please shift the burden, let's start the trial. And the Court of Chancery just couldn't do that very often with independent committees. So the result was you started the trial, but you didn't really know who was going to have the burden. In a case called America's Mining, which is significant for other reasons, the Delaware Supreme Court said, let's provide clarity. And we said the rule is going to be, if you can't shift the burden before the trial by establishing the independence and the process of the committee, or by establishing a fully disclosed minority, majority of the minority vote, then the burden's just not gonna shift. So that's the law now. You have to establish one or the other before the trial or the burden remains with the controlling shareholder. Now, <laughs> America's Mining is a case that was decided um, two years ago, and it was significant for a couple of reasons. First, it developed the law that I just told you about. But second, it was a controlling shareholder uh, interested transaction where the controlling shareholder lost the case. And the judgment against the controlling shareholder was over $2 billion, and the attorney's fees that were awarded were $300 million. And what happened in that case was the committee was independent, but uh, according to the chancellor, they exercised or demonstrated what was called a controller mindset. So as a result of that, um, they didn't come up with a fair price and that's why the judgment was so high. 
So then we come forward uh, to this year, and the Delaware Supreme Court decided a case called MFW. And after many years of debate about burden shifting, if you have a majority of the minority or an independent committee that functions, the Court of Chancery had kept saying over and over, how about if you have both? If you have an independent committee fully functioning and an informed vote of the majority of the minority, can we get business judgment? And the Court of Chancery said, yes. And that was appealed to the Delaware Supreme Court. And the issue was uh, the Delaware Supreme Court agreed, we affirmed. So the law in Delaware now is that if you're a controlling shareholder, and at the very beginning of the transaction with the minority, you declare, we're not going to go forward with this transaction unless you have both a majority of the minority vote and the recommendation of a fully functioning independent committee, uh, then if you do that and you prove both of those things, or then you're going to be able to get business judgment. Now, what's significant about that is that because this was being decided for the first time in the Court of Chancery, it was a summary judgment case, and there had been a lot of discovery, and there was a full record, and the Court of Chancery said the controlling shareholder had established those things, granted summary judgment, applied the business judgment rule, and the case was dismissed on summary judgment. But the real issue in the case was can you ever get the complaint dismissed? And what the Court of Chancery said is, yes, you can get the complaint dismissed, and you don't have to go through the expense of discovery, and the Delaware Supreme Court agreed. Now, whenever we write our decisions, we think we're writing with clarity, and as I said, they're unanimous, but inevitably, uh, professors and lawyers look at our opinion and wonder what we really meant. And this isn't new. When we decided the Time Warner case in 1989, we thought we were pretty clear. But then four years later, in 1993, in Paramount versus QVC, we had to make it even clearer. So I'm going to tell you as clearly as I can what we intended in MFW, even though people are reading it in different ways. And what we intended in MFW is to say there are cases where the majority shareholder puts these two, two protections in place and they will get dismissed. The complaint will get dismissed. Now, in the chancellor's decision, he said, if you can show the committee wasn't independent or you can show that there wasn't full disclosure, raise a question about that, then the complaint would not get dismissed. But the Delaware Supreme Court was thinking Lawyers will learn from our opinion, and they'll advise their controlling shareholder accordingly, and a lot of complaints will be dismissed because you can't raise a question. So let me give you an example of how I think that will work. We don't want protracted discovery if you're going to dismiss a complaint, but before you bring the lawsuit, you can get the SEC filings about the independence of the committee and you can ask for the books and records of the company about the independence of the committee. If those filings show that your independent committee were your three cousins, no one else? No one would think that's an independent committee. So the complaint wouldn't get dismissed because while you said you put an independent committee in place, you really didn't. On the other hand, people know that the three cousins aren't gonna withstand judicial scrutiny so you never have an independent committee composed of three cousins. You have an independent committee composed of really independent people. You can find those facts and the complaint will be dismissed. So we'll see how that plays out, but I thought it was important for me to clarify for you that the majority unanimous opinion in MFW thought that controlling shareholders would learn from our opinion and complaints would get dismissed without discovery. Now the last point I want to make uh, before I conclude 
is that there are other situations where the controlling shareholder isn't dealing with the minority, but third parties are involved. So the first principle of Delaware law would be that if you just want to sell your stock, your majority stock to a third party, you can do that. There are no fiduciary duties, no concerns. Uh, you can just sell your stock. But once the whole company is going to be sold and there's going to be consideration for you that's maybe different than the minority or the whole company is going to be sold and you have a, a right to veto the sale of the whole company, there are other considerations that come into place. And the Court of Chancery has decided a case called Hammonds. And what the Court of Chancery said in Hammonds is that in those situations, maybe you should put the two procedural protections in place that we see in MFW. Now, that case hasn't come to the Delaware Supreme Court yet, and the Court of Chancery isn't completely unanimous in its view, so that's an area of the law that will develop. So, and, um, in conclusion, what you can see is that the law develops over a period of time marginally, but as it develops marginally, it does promote stability and predictability. And while it's taken a long time for the Delaware Supreme Court to say, if you have the dual protections of a minority vote and the business judgment rule and the um, independent committee, you can get the business judgment rule. The question is how many people are gonna to try to put in dual protections? And if you don't put in the dual protections, we're gonna be back to the entire fairness standard and the question will be, does the burden shift or doesn't it shift? So I want to um, conclude now because I've used my time, but I am happy to answer any questions. Um, Zohar said I could answer questions for five minutes. Yes? Um, when you get the fair price under the fair, uh, under the entire fairness, what does it mean? Is it the highest price or is it just the best price under the circumstances which you do the DCF on? Yeah, what the Delaware Supreme Court has said is that there's no one model. So most of the time people are using the um, discounted cash flow, but not always. They're doing market comparisons and they're doing other things. And what we see most frequently in those cases is they try to take a triangulated approach and they come up with three valuations. DCF is only one of them. And they try to say they all basically come out the same way. Yes. I would like to understand, uh, under a uh, MFW method or principle, how you can know without discovery uh, that the independent committee did its job well. Well, that's what I was saying, that um, the only source of information would be SEC filings, which are pretty complete. And under Section 220 of the Delaware Corporate Code, if you're a shareholder, you can ask for books and records. So one of the things you ask for is the committee's report, the committee valuation. But in Delaware, you don't get any pre-complaint discovery. But in MFW, we said your remedy under Section 220 combined with SEC filings should give you enough information if there is a problem to identify the problem. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one of the main roles of corporate courts is to review decisions made by corporate organs, usually the board of directors, both ex ante, when a plaintiff seeks an injunction against a future decision that has not yet been made, and ex post, when a plaintiff claims a certain decision that was already made and executed is unreasonable and negligent and caused him damages. And I'd like to talk to, today about the met methods applied by the courts in reviewing corporate decisions. So we are all familiar, at least now, with the business judgment rule and the entire fairness doctrine and the new ruling of the MFW uh, um, decision in the Delaware Supreme Court. But before discussing them, I would like to try to make a certain distinction between two different kinds of methods, the substantive review and the procedural review. Substantive review is normally used in reviewing conflicted decisions. 
The court reviews the decision itself, the merits of the decision, and considers the question whether, to the judge's opinion, this was the right decision the board had to make, according to all of the relevant circumstances known to the board at the time. If, for example, the board decided to purchase an asset on behalf of the company, the court may check whether the price the company agreed to pay was the right price, whether investing in this specific area was the right decision at the time, etc. Under Israeli law, the court has the authority to review a decision on its merits in the case of appraisal claims, and courts in appraisal claims have to decide whether the fair value of the purchased shares, what the fair value of the purchased shares should be. Supposedly, the idea that the court, to let the court review the decisions made on behalf of the company may seem like a very good idea. A disinterested, objective third party makes all the right decisions on behalf of the company when necessary. The court, being both professional and totally disinterested, should theoretically be able to reach all the best decisions on behalf of the company, rather than the decisions made by the usually conflicted majority or even by the so-called disinterested minority. All of the shareholders could be sure someone is protecting them, someone whose only worry is to benefit the company. But of course, despite what I just said, uh, there are naturally some clear disadvantages to this method. First of all, the assumption that the court, even an expert professional court, can make all the right decisions on behalf of the company is at least a very doubtful assumption. Business decisions are best made by business people, preferably the ones that are the real parties to the deal and not by the party that would not have to bear the consequences of the decision. Another disadvantage is the fact that the party to the transaction, for example, the majority shareholder that purchased the minority's share, cannot be sure that the terms he or she agreed upon will be confirmed by the court. And a court decision forcing the majority to increase the agreed price is naturally very problematic. Apart from that, if the minority shareholders know that they can claim that the price they agreed upon for their shares is not the fair price, their motivation to agree only when the price is fair from their point of view is not strong, which will make it difficult to rely on their agreement later uh, if the court is looking for uh, uh, something to rely upon. Procedural review, on the other hand, is normally used in reviewing non-conflicted decision. When using this method, the court does not review the substance of the decision, but only checks whether the board applied the full necessary procedure before it, its, its re it reached its decision. When applying a procedural review, the court is not a player in the decision-making field, but rather a policeman, making sure the players are playing by the rules. After the rules have been set, the role of the court is then more technical, to make sure the decision makers did what they had to do before making the decision. And if so, the decision is supposedly immune from court intervention. According to the procedur procedural approach, the court's only task is to make sure that the pre preconditions for making the decision have been met. If this is the case, the deal will be approved regardless, regardless of its terms and conditions. Supporters of this approach would be more skeptical of the court's ability to make better business decisions than the relevant organs of the company. Besides the question re regarding the ability of the court to make good business decisions on behalf of the company, and the question regarding the ability to scientifically estimate the right price of the deal, especially when we're talking about appraising the value of a company which involves predictions about a lot of unknown future variables, the so-called procedural method has other advantages as well. If courts have less power to intervene with a company's decision, it certainly has an effect on the number of times plaintiffs would seek such, such intervention, and it might decrease the potential for meritless suits overburdening the court. Apart from that, if the court is only authorized to check the decision-making process, it would enable the decision-makers to feel more secure that as long as they followed the relevant procedure, the court would not intervene with the terms of the deal, an intervention that is contrary to their expectations. Furthermore, the procedure in which the court checks the substance of the decision, either by itself or with the help of, of an expert, is a very expensive one since a third party, which is an outsider to the deal, has to learn all the relevant information about the deal, about the company, about the relevant market. 
Courts usually declare that they wish to refrain from inf intervening in business decisions made by business people and that they prefer to only supervise the procedure. The business judgment rule is an example of a rule that when applied directs the court to refrain from intervention. When the board is making an informed decision in good faith and there is no conflict of interest, the court will not intervene with the decision of the board. I should add that the business judgment rule was applied several times by courts in Israel, although its exact scope has not yet been decided. So where there is a conflict of interest, the role of the court in reviewing the decision is different, normally entailing a substantive review. However, there still can be procedural conditions that may immune the decision from intervention by the court. The court in Israel tried to direct future boards to, to a procedure that, if followed, would enable the court to refrain from checking the merits of the decision and intervening with it in cases there is a conflict and the business judgment rule does not apply. Such was the case in the Israeli court's decision of Mahdeshi Magan of Kim China, where there was a merger between a parent and a subsidiary. The court advised future parties of a procedure that, if followed, would minimize the risk of court's intervention. The procedure men mentioned by Judge Keret Meir that gave that decision included negotiating, negotiating the terms of the deal in a way that would replicate a real arm's length negotiation by both setting an independent committee and having the final terms approved by the majority of the minority shareholder. Um, which is a legal precondition in Israel. In the MFW case that dealt with an acquisition of the minority by the majority, the Delaware Supreme Court described the facts as follows. Th from the outset, M and F's proposal to take MFW par private <clears throat> was made contingent upon two stockholder protective procedural conditions. First, M and F required the merger to be negotiated and approved by a special committee of independent MFW directors. And second, M and F required that the merger be approved by a majority of the stockholders unaffiliated with M and F. So in the short, times, sh short time I have, I would like to make two comments about these methods of review and of some dilemmas that they present. First, I'd like to talk about the difficulty to refrain from intervention without checking the merits of the decision. I think that at least as much as Israeli judges are concerned, or at least as, as far as I am concerned, it is not easy to give up the ability to review the substance of the corporate decision in question and to only check the procedural aspects of the decision, the, of the decision making process. I believe that being able to give up the control over checking the substance of the decision may require some self-educating about the value of restraint if we truly wish to imply the procedural rules. Suppose the court decides that the relevant decision being attacked is subject to the business judgment rule standard. The rhetoric of the court would most probably be, since I am applying the business judgment rule, I will not intervene in the decision. The court most probably will not comment on the decision itself and will generally not say that it is not intervening despite the fact that the decision is bad or a stupid decision. Even though in the case of business judgment rule, there should be no intervention, even if the decision seems to the judge wrong or stupid. When implementing the business judgment rule, I find that I write the decision in two parts. In part one, I will explain why I should not intervene with the discretion of the board due to the business judgment rule. But then I will add a part two in which, to be on the safe side, I will check the decision on its merits to make sure it is a valid and a reasonable decision. This is what happened in one case I uh, dealt with, or Matt case, where th there was um, the plaintiff filed a motion for a derivative suit, since the company's board would not file such a suit against third parties, despite the plaintiff's op opinion that they should do so. So after concluding in the first part of my decision that the board's decision was protected by the BJR, by the business judgment rule, since the claim was against third parties, and not against the mem board members or against controlling shareholders, I went on and checked the board's decision on its merits and found it to be reas a reasonable one. And this is what I believe happens in many of the cases in which the courts in Israel decide to refrain from intervention. The decision would usually look like I described. In the first part of the decision, the judge will explain why the court should not intervene with the decision, and then above and beyond, the court will check the merits of the decision. So what I'm saying may have to do with the psychology of judges. 
I think most judges, at least most Israeli judges, will feel better if when looking into the decision itself, they would be satisfied that it seems a reasonable one. It is difficult for a judge to allow a company to act in a way that she thinks is wrong and harmful, even if we agree that it is not our role as judges to intervene in such decisions. But the implementation of the procedural rules is really put into test in those cases where the judge finds that the decision-making process was a due process. Then, if we want to be honest with ourselves, the question we have to ask ourselves is whether we would approve a decision or refrain from intervening if we suspect the decision does not make sense or if we are sure it is a wrong decision. As I said, for a judge, it may not be an easy task to refrain from checking the merits of the relevant decision that is being attacked and improving it, disregarding its substance, only because the court should refrain from intervening in such cases and since the decision-making decision process was a valid one. It is easier to do so if we are convinced that refraining from intervention only means substituting judicial remedy for other remedies provided through markets or through private parties. <clears throat> Uh, now I'd like to talk a little, about, a little about applying the procedural requirements. Courts would usually refrain from intervention in non-conflicted decisions. As I said, but as for decisions that involve a conflict of interest, Israeli courts are still shaping the scope and method, method of intervention. The fact that there is a legal procedure set in the leg legislature in these cases, as I said, approval by the majority of the, the non-affiliated minority, did not stop co the court in Mahdashim Agan, which I mentioned before, from intervening. However, as I mentioned, the court offered a procedure that, if applied, may immune the decision from intervention. So the court mentioned that the negotiations should be by an independent committee, with power to effectively vote against the deal, that will conduct actual real negotiations, that will not meet in the presence of the controlling shareholders, and that will have the opportunity to hire independent advisors. The Court of Chancery in the MFW case held that the business judgment standard of review should apply if, but only if, first, the controller conditions the transaction on approval of both a special committee and a majority of the minority stockholders, and the special committee is independent, the special committee is empowered to freely select its own advisors and to say no definitively, the special committee acts with care, the minority vote is informed, and there is no cohesion of the minority. The Court of Chancery found that these prerequisites were satisfied, and the court then reviewed the merger under the business judgment rule and granted summary judgment for the defendants. The question we're, that we're dealing with now is the question of applying these prerequisites and more precisely, the question is what the court should do if when checking where these prerequisites were satisfied, its, its answer is not 100% positive. What should be the standard applied if, for example, there is an independent committee and it is independent, not the three cousins. It is empowered to say no definitively, but it has no power to select it on, its own advisors and it was advised by the company's lawyers or the company's accountants. That, does this by itself mean that the court should check the contents of the decision? In other words, if the procedure is not 100% as it should be, but only 90%, 80 70%, when should we go back to the entire fairness doctrine? When should the burden shift back to the defendants? And what if the controlling shareholder was present in some of the meetings, in all of them? Would that be enough to conclude that the court cannot rely on the procedure and has to check the merits of the decision? That the burden of proof shifted back to the majority to satisfy the court of the entire fairness of the deal? My focus is that the center of attention of the courts will shift in the future from reviewing the substance of the decision to thoroughly reviewing the decision-making process. Such a review, in Israel at least, I think may require discovery proceedings uh, that would be aimed at revealing the process of the negotiations and not the terms of the deal itself. If, after thoroughly checking the process, the court is satisfied that the procedure was followed, checking the terms of the deal and its fairness is unnecessary. In other words, if we take the procedural review seriously, also in the case of conflicted decision, it may reduce the necessity to check the terms of the transaction and review them. This makes the process cheaper, 
since there is, not, there is no necessity to compare between the expert opinions, which is very problematic as we heard, and to cross-examine the experts, but only to make sure that the negotiation process followed the court's directions. A similar question may, may arise when applying the business judgment rule. When dealing with the business judgment rule, the court has to check in order to apply the rule that the board was fully informed and that there was no conflict of interest. But these questions are not always black and white as well. For example, what if the board was not 100% fully informed? If the board did not get 100% of, of the relevant information? And moreover, what if there was no direct conflict of interest between the majority and the minority? It is not a decision regarding the, con the, regarding the controlling shareholders' compensation. But the majority has different interests than the minority. Uh, again, the same question arises. Should we apply the business judgment rule despite the fact that the preconditions were not 100% met? So I only raised a few questions, some of which have already been dealt with in the past, and the others would probably be dealt with in the future. Thank you. Yes, good morning to everyone. I have an excuse to use the presentation today. I told Zohar that I'm not feeling so good, so I'll be speaking less and showing more. Hopefully that I'll pass these 15 minutes without too many questions from the side of the audience. <laughs> uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, these meetings between judges from Delaware and uh, Columbia University and other universities and Kiriakono University and judges from Israel and lawyers that are dealing with corporate cases means a lot to us. I mean, we look always at Delaware, what you're doing, your ruling, your sentence, and I have to say that we get a weekly report about the new ruling that coming from Delaware, and if we don't get it, the lawyers in Israel will show it and will be will, will show it to us every day that there is a new ruling like the MFW that I got the decision, the ruling from my assistant this, the second day, but lawyers that are present here in this uh, room they have, been, have been so anxious to let me know that the ruling of the Chancery Court was affirmed by the Supreme Court of Delaware once, one time after the other, in one case after the other. So in similar cases that are, are dealt in my, in my courtroom, and uh, of course the lawyers of the corporate, of the corporate, of the corporate were trying and still trying to convince us that we should adopt the ruling of uh, the, chance of the Supreme Court of Delaware, but still it's not so easy for us to do that, and I'll try to show the figures that makes the difference between the Delaware, Supreme Court, the Delaware court cases and the Israeli court cases. I'm using a new uh, presentation called Trezi. It's for the first time I'm using this and it's very uh, delicate, so please uh, take me for that. Some figures about the Israeli capital market. We have 618 companies are traded on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, 486, 486 publicly traded companies and other companies are financial instruments and bond companies. The total market of, I'm, I'm talking about data from the Tel Aviv Exchange statistics from end of May last month. Total market value of publicly traded corporate bonds is 272 billion new, new Israeli shekels. About 57 of the publicly traded share capital held by the public itself and not by the controlling shareholders. And the total market value of the shares in the publicly traded companies is about $746 billion. That's equal to 214 billion uh, shekels, equal to $214 billion. <coughs> the 
I will emphasize now the three major problems as I see them in the Israeli stock market or the Israeli, especially the Israeli stock market. About 85% of the public companies in Israel controlled by controlling shareholders, unlike the states that the number is less than 10%. Empirical studies indicate that the average control premium in Israel is around 25 to 27%, compared with an average of 14% in the developed countries, and in the US it's less than 2%. 24 major business groups control about 23 of the publicly traded companies in Israel, and 68% of the total stock market capitalization is controlled by 24 major business companies or groups in Israel. Recent developments in Israel, as I, I can proudly say part of it, they have been made in the last, all of it has been made in the last four or five years since late 2010. We'll start with the legislation and legislative amendments, amendment 16 to 22 of companies law, then the Tel Aviv District Court Economic Division established in 2010, 15 of December. 15 of December. Inspired by the Court of Chancery of Delaware, the third amendment was the administrative enforcement to enforce security laws by Israeli Security Authority. The fourth was private enforcement through der derivative actions and class actions, and I have to say that we have been seeing in the last few years a huge increase of cases brought to, to court, to our court, through this uh, uh, der derivative and action, uh, class actions co cases. And the final one, and one of the most important one, is the Committee of Increasing Competitiveness in the Economy. That is late, in the last two months, uh, most of the recommendations were adopted, primarily the reduction pyramids and the separation of financial and non-financial holdings. These were, uh, as I said, recently legislated in manner of spreading and widening the base of the pyramid structure in Israel. Okay, we'll come to the U.S. capital markets. I don't know how to, to say that figure, but I believe that it's 18 <laughs> trillion or 18 super trillion. <laughs> Decentralization control, only 23 of the market capitalization is controlled by business group. Only point, less than 1% of all listed companies are controlled through a pyramidic, pyramidic pyramidal structure in, in the states. And I hope that one day we can put that sign near the Tel Aviv District Court. Welcome to, to the District Court of Tel Aviv, the Economic Division, but we're not allowed to do that. We'll never be allowed to do that. <laughs> More than 50% of the publicly traded companies in the United States, including 64 of the Fortune 500, have incorporated in Delaware. And anyone of us have, that have been in Delaware, you would think, because of these figures, that Delaware is double than New York or double than California. But if you go through from Philadelphia to New York, you'll find it difficult to see Delaware. It's a very small state, but as we can see, from the figures that it says, I mean, not only in the use, in the, not only the 500 fortune, but almost every, every country in the world is looking forward to see what your decisions are and try to adapt some of it that can be adapted in, the, in, in, in this country at least. I want, I, a, Delaware is encouraging every country in the world to come and register it in Delaware, uh, not in any other country in, in the States, any other state in the States, or any other country in the world. I will speak about the last developments in the Israeli market, adopting standards of judicial review, who have been uh, 
hearing today from Judge Holland and Judge Ronen about the, the difference between the business judgment rule and the entire fairness. We're dealing with these cases now these days. The MFW is being held, is being dealt now these days in Israel in separate cases. And uh, as far as I know, uh, we uh, will respect very much the uh, the ruling of the uh, MFW, but we are not completely convinced that we have we have to adopt it in 100% in that way that you you have ad adopted that, and that is because of the differences between the power of controlling shareholder in the Israel in the Israeli market and non power of, of non existing uh, of controlling shareholders in the states almost in in, in, in that percentage Recon reconsideration and appeal the law in Israel the new law now gave gave a rise to a new procedure according according to which an approval to a file case action or derivative claim should be reconsidered by a panel of three judges from the same tribunal. That means we don't have to, for the decisions that approve the class action in the economic division, we decide that loses the case, doesn't go to the Supreme Court of Israel, but comes to the, the panel of three judges of the economic division in the district court. Hopefully, that is because the, our Supreme Court, unlike the, the American Supreme Court, suffers from a endless a numbers of cases they have to deal with. If I have to compare the Supreme Court of the United States, they are dealing with 85 cases every year. Our Supreme Court is dealing with more than 10,000 cases a year. So if, if, every, if every rule from our court will go to the Supreme Court, I have to wait on the line for its time to come, and it can take, and it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, 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 a prison guy, a, a guy in a prison that you have to deal with this case immediately, and it's not a public case that you have to deal with it immediately, so it will be, it will be waiting in the waiting list. It can take six months or a year, and in, our, in, in cases that we are dealing with, we, the companies cannot wait such a long time to get a ruling, a final ruling from the court. Uh, why the, uh, all these amendments meant to get and uh, to achieve a, a, a goal that these cases will be dealt, you said, about 90%, 90 days for, for a ruling. We try to adopt these uh, methods in Israel and try to give the ruling as soon as possible. Because companies need that, not only the confidence, but the ability to know that the court can supply the final ruling within a reasonable time, and not influencing their future uh, plans, and not to postpone them for a year or two years until the court will give his ruling. And about using the independent board committee, I have to say that companies in Israel are that are lately, recently, adopting this method very in almost in every case that is dealt with in, in the courts now these days. And that is because, I'm not saying we uh, have educated the lawyers, the, the lawyers have educated themselves that it's much easier for them to come to the court and say we have, the company have, uh, have already stated about the independent board committee as a way to try to convince the court not to intervene the decisions that made by the, uh, these uh, uh, committees. Uh, I would say, Zohar asked me to say some words about the, how do I see the, in the future, the development, the developments in the future in the Israeli stock market. Uh, I would say that it isn't, as we see, it isn't a combat between the controlling shareholders, even though they are controlling over 85% of the uh, companies in Israel. It's not a combat between the controlling shareholders and the, and, uh, the, uh, the shareholders themselves. It's not a, the combat between the bad guys and the good guys, as we see. Controlling shareholders, we believe that 
have the same target as other shareholders, to increase the confidence of the public in the stock market, and by that to, to create more profitable businesses in the market. The court itself doesn't have an agenda. We don't, we don't stand by the shareholders against the controlling shareholders. But as the last the amendments in the Israeli stock market, we see very uh, important to assure that the stock market or the, the behavior of the controlling shareholder will not affect and influence the, uh, uh, the price of the shares in a matter that uh, we like to think that we can assure the, the shareholders to have the feeling that the court will support them whenever the stock controlling shareholder is trying to get a gain the, uh, the best of the company for himself and not for the shareholders. But it's not the good, by, good guys against the bad guys. It's the, the trying to find a, a way or a, a fair formula that balances the power of the controlling shareholder in order to enforce a fair dealing, first of all, and to encourage the investors by applying transparency and fair dealing rules. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Justice Joram Denziger, for Justice Randy Holland, which I'm sure you know he wrote the Supreme Court decision on the NFW case, to Justice Ruth Romer, Justice Khaled Kabu. Thank you.